In this last section, we are going to talk about how to draw compounds if you are given their name. And this is typically considered to be much easier than going in the other direction because the name gives you almost all the information that you need to come up with the molecular formula. With the compounds that you will be given, the positively charged species is almost always a single element. So remember there is only two positively charged polyatomics. So most likely when you are given a compound to draw, the species to the left is going to be a single element. The negatively charged species, or the part that's to the right, can be an element or a polyatomic. So elements can be negatively charged and polyatomics can be negatively charged. The ending of the name can give you a little bit of help. If the ending is eyed, most of the time you are dealing with an element. And if the ending is eight or eight, most of the time you are dealing with polyatomics. So there are a couple of exceptions to this rule, like cyanide and hydroxide, but the rest of the time this is generally true. One of the most important things that you need to remember when writing a formula is that the positive and negative charges need to cancel. If you don't do this, you will end up with an incorrect answer. So this is something that we are going to use to check our answers once we have created the formula of the compound. If the species that is named first inside of the name of the compound is a metal, then the charges of the positively charged and negatively charged species should be defined. So you should know exactly what the charges are by either understanding the polyatomic or looking at the periodic table. Here's our first question. We want to draw the structure of sodium oxide. The first element named is sodium, so it's a metal. Then what I want to do is say what elements are involved here. Notice there's an ide ending, so oxide is probably referring to oxygen. So you look at the first syllable, ox, and you try to find the element that corresponds to this. The oxide part is going to be oxygen. I then go to the periodic table and say what are the defined charges of sodium and oxygen. They're both part of the main group of the periodic table, which means they have defined charges. Sodium is in group one, so it is a plus one. Oxygen is expected to have a minus two charge. After you determine what elements that you have, the next thing you want to do is to combine them in such a way that their charges cancel out so that the charge of the final compound that you draw is neutral. There's a few different ways of doing this. The first way is to realize that sodium is plus one and oxygen is minus two, so I'm, I'm going to need two sodiums in order for the charges to cancel. What's really common nowadays is to use this simple trick where you draw out each individual species, so I have sodium plus and oxygen two minus, and then I realize in my answer, in my compound, the charges turn into a subscript. So here, the minus two charge on oxygen means that I'm going to need two sodiums. The plus one charge on sodium here means that I'm going to need one oxygen. So we leave this one as a placeholder just so that we can see it, but when we draw out the actual compound, we do not put a subscript one there the charge on one element becomes the subscript on the other element. And this almost always leads to the correct answer. So our answer for this, for sodium oxide, is Na2O. And then in the last step, we want to look at our answer and make sure that the charges cancel. Inside of Na2O, I have two sodiums. Each one of those is plus one charge. So if I add up the two positively charged sodiums, overall I have a plus two charge. I have a minus two charged oxygen. So the positive charge and the negative charge equal each other. I know I have the right answer. If the first element named is a transition metal, I need to remember that the charge on the transition metal is stated in the name as a Roman numeral. Transition metals have a variable charge and so I need to find out what the charge is. Fortunately, the charge is given in the name. So that's a piece of information that I'll have to gain. In this case, the charge of the negatively charged species, the thing to the right, should be defined. It should be either an element or a polyatomic. Here's our next question, iron to carbonate. The first thing I want to do is figure out what actual species we are dealing with. So iron is given. I want to know what the charge is on the iron, and that's given here as 2. So this Roman numeral 2 becomes 
a plus two charge. That's what the Roman numeral two says here is that my iron has a plus two charge. And here we have carbon eight. So the eight ending means that this is a polyatomic. And then I say, what's the molecular formula of carbonate and what's the charge on carbonate? Carbonate is CO3 two minus. I then wanna combine these together in such a way that their charges cancel out to get a neutral species. And so in this case, when we combine compounds together, if their charges are the same, so in this case, iron is plus two, carbonate is minus two, if their charges are the same, they will combine together in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we don't need to have multiple irons or multiple carbonates to reach a neutral charge. We simply combine them together. So there's going to be one iron and one carbonate in my answer. And this is due to the fact that the iron and the carbonate were the same charge. So our answer for the formula of iron two carbonate is FeCO3. We then wanna take a second and make sure that our charges cancel each other out to lead to a neutral formula here. Inside of our compound, we had a plus two iron, and there was only one of those. And then we had one negatively two charged carbonate. And here, this means that we have a total plus charge of plus two and a total negative charge of minus two. So overall, these combine together to create a neutral species. So this is our correct answer. Doing another one, iron to nitride. The first thing you wanna do is figure out what species are involved. Iron is a transition metal. We know that that's Fe. The two tells me the charge on my iron. So I know I'm dealing with iron two plus. Nitride, because it has an eyed ending, this is most likely an element. So with a couple of exceptions, very common to try to turn this into say nitrate or nitrite. The ending IDE is specific for elements with a couple of exceptions. So nitride, and I say what element is probably corresponding to this, it is a nitrogen. I then go to the periodic table and say, what is the typical charge on nitrogen? Nitrogen is part of the main group. So nitrogen is expected to have a minus three charge. Because their charges are not the same, we need to combine them in a ratio such that when we're done, we create a neutral species. Here, we're going to use the idea that the charge on one atom becomes the subscript on the other atom. So because iron is plus two, we're gonna need two nitrogens in our formula. Because nitrogen is minus three, we're gonna need three irons in our formula. So we get the answer of Fe3N2. We wanna take a second and check our charges to make sure that we have reached neutrality. We have three irons, all of them are plus two. So when I add up the total positive charge, I get plus six. I have two nitrogens, they're both minus three. So my total negative charge is minus six. So our charges cancel each other out, leading to a neutral species. So this is our answer for iron two nitride. It is Fe3N2. When drawing acids, you can tell you're dealing with a binary acid because the first word is hydro. In this case, we expect the negatively charged species to be an element and really what you need to do is find the charge on that element and then add enough hydrogens to make the acid neutral. I'm given hydrobromic acid because hydro is the first word to come in there. I know it's going to be a binary acid. I then need to figure out what is the other element. If I remove the ic acid, I'm left with brome. So the other element is bromine. I go to the periodic table. Bromine's part of the main group. So bromine is expected to have a minus one charge. I then say how many H pluses must I add to bromine to make it neutral? Because it has a negative one charge, I only need one H plus, and so I get my answer of HBr. With oxyanions, you can tell it's an oxyanion because it has the word acid at the end and the first word is not hydro. Really all that remains is oxyanions. The first thing you wanna do is figure out what polyatomic is involved inside of your acid. So you need to determine the polyatomic and then determine the charge on the negatively charged polyatomic. Then you add enough hydrogens to make the acid neutral. Very much like what we did with binary acids. Here we're gonna be reversing the rules that we were using in the nomenclature of oxyacids. 
if the acid, the name that's given to you, has an ic acid ending, the polyatomic will have an eight ending. If the acid has an us ending, the polyatomic will have an ite ending. Here I give you chlorous acid, and I ask you to draw the formula for chlorous acid. The first thing I want to do is determine the polyatomic. The given acid is an us acid, so we're going to want to remove the us, and this is going to be replaced with ite. So us acids become ite, and that tells me that my the polyatomic is the chlorite ion. So I need to be able to come up with the formula of the chlorite ion, and I also need to be able to come up with the charge. So chlorite ion is ClO2 minus. Once I have this, then I add enough hydrogens to make the compound neutral. So for every negative charge, I need to add a H plus. Because chlorite only has one negative charge, I add one H plus to it, and what we end up with is HClO2. Drawing molecular compounds is probably the easiest because the name gives me both elements that are involved and it also tells me how many of each element is in the compound by the prefixes. Here I give you diboron tetrachloride and I ask you to draw the molecular formula for it. I say what two elements are involved in this. The first one is boron, it's given in your name, so B. And then the second one, remember we need to remove the ide ending and we are given the first syllable of the other element. So the first syllable is chlor, so I know this is going to be chlorine. I then need to find out how many of these elements are inside of my molecular formula. This is given to me by the prefixes. So diboron means that there are two borons. Tetrachloride means that there are four chlorines inside of my molecular formula. So it's all given inside of the name. I then ask for nitrogen trioxide. I want to find out what elements are involved. So nitrogen is given, so we're going to have an N oxide. Remember, we remove the ide and the first syllable is given, so ox or oxygen. So I know I'm going to have a nitrogen and an oxygen in my answer. I then need to determine how many nitrogens and oxygens I have in my compound. Notice that there is no prefix in front of nitrogen. That means that there is only one of them. So when no prefix is given in front of the first named element, that means that there is only one of them. So just saying nitrogen means I only have one nitrogen. The trioxide means I have three of them. So tri means three. So I have three oxygens and my answer is NO3.